Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Susan Shand, Alice Bryant, and Brian Lynn. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Susan Shand. Chinese technology business Huawei is taking the United States to court. Huawei wants a U.S. federal court to rule on a law that identifies the company as a security risk. It also claims the measure would limit the company's ability to sell its products in the United States. Huawei Technologies Limited announced the legal action on Thursday. The case asks the court to reject as unconstitutional part of the legislation setting military spending levels. The measure bars the U.S. government and businesses working for the government from using Huawei equipment. Huawei is the world's largest maker of telecommunications technology. The company is fighting to keep its worldwide market share as phone carriers prepare to release the next generation of technology called 5G. The U.S. government has urged America's allies not to use Huawei equipment. The lawsuit was filed in Plano, Texas, where Huawei has its U.S. headquarters. The company's complaint argues that the law violates the U.S. Constitution. Huawei says the law punishes the company for unproven accusations and would harm its future earnings. Relations between the United States and China have been tense over technology competition and use of computers to gather information. Huawei has argued for years that it is not involved in Chinese spying. It also argues that the Chinese Communist Party has no control over the company. We were forced to take this legal action, the company's chairman, Guo Ping, said at a press conference. Guo said the ban would limit competition and lead to higher prices for telecom services. He also said it would delay the release of 5G communications. In January, Huawei has said in court it is not guilty of U.S. trade theft charges. The court statement came after a federal court in Seattle, Washington, announced charges against two of the company's businesses in January. Huawei's chief financial officer, Meng Wenzhou, was arrested in Canada on December 1st. 2018. The U.S. government has charged her with lying to banks about doing business with Iran. U.S. officials have asked Canada to send her to the United States for trial. On December 10th, China arrested two Canadians, a former diplomat and a businessman in what many observers think is an attempt to get Canada to release Meng. On Thursday, a Chinese foreign ministry official said China also objects to the U.S. law. He did not know if the government would join Huawei's lawsuit. He added that Huawei has the right to defend its business through the legal system. 
Huawei has about 40% of the international market for telecom equipment. But it sells very little in the United States after Congress said the company was a security risk in 2012. Congress told American businesses to avoid Huawei products. Huawei says the new law would make it illegal for anyone working for the U.S. government to buy the company's products. It would also ban any company in the world that uses Huawei products from working with the U.S. government. The United States makes up 20 to 25 percent of the worldwide market for computer and telecom technology. Huawei says the law would shrink its market share. The ban is based on numerous false, unproven, and untested accusations, the company's chief legal officer, Song Liuping, told reporters. He also said there is no evidence against Huawei. Australia, Japan, Taiwan, and some other governments have also set limits on using Huawei technology. Huawei wants to negotiate with U.S. officials about their security concerns, but the law bars President Donald Trump from agreeing to negotiations, Gua said. He noted Trump has said he is against the ban of Huawei products. Industry experts say banning Huawei from markets for 5G equipment could reduce competition. It might also cause higher prices. Huawei says it supplies 45 of the world's top 50 telecom companies. It also has agreements with 30 other companies to test 5G technology, it says. Chinese officials and some industry experts say the U.S. government might be overstating security concerns to limit competition with Western telecom companies. European governments are refusing to accept the U.S.'s requests to ban Huawei. The company has also announced deals with telecom companies in the Middle East. I'm Susan Shand. Hi, everyone. Do you feel like playing a little word game today? I do. Okay, here it is. I will give you the words. Your job is to identify the meanings without searching the internet. Here is the first word. Doggy. Can you guess the meaning? Surely you know what a dog is, but what's a doggy? A doggy can be a small dog or a baby dog. Or it can be a loving term for a dog of any size. In English, Adding the letter Y to the end of some words can suggest the things they describe are small or well-loved. We call this the diminutive. A diminutive can express other qualities as well, like that something is familiar, sad, or disliked. Diminutives can show warmth or kindness for a thing or person. They can also be used to insult. Today, we will explore American English diminutives made from many word endings as well as the prefix many. Learning diminutives can help you recognize variants of English words. It can also offer you a more natural and broader selection of vocabulary as your English becomes more fluent. Let's start by returning 
to the ending Y, which is sometimes spelled IE with no change in meaning. For instance, the word doggy can be written D-O-G-G-Y or D-O-G-G-I-E. The Y and I-E endings are used only with some words, such as the nouns birdie, doggy, mommy, and daddy. The words mommy and daddy, as you might guess, don't refer to small parents. They are terms of familiarity and warmth. Note the doubling of the middle letter in many of these words. That spelling also applies to some nicknames, like Nikki, taken from Nicole, or Bobby, taken from Robert. The IE ending is also used with some adjectives, like sweet, forming the noun sweetie, and cute, forming the noun cutie. Can you guess what sweetie and cutie mean without checking the internet? Note that the examples so far today are not suitable for formal English speech or writing. And take note, not all English words ending in Y or IE or any other form we'll explore today make a diminutive meaning. In fact, most do not. The word funny, for example, does not mean a small amount of fun. Then there is the word ending ish. The letters ish can be added to the end of many English nouns to make adjectives that mean somewhat like or similar to. With that in mind, you can likely tell me what the words bluish and reddish mean. Here's another example, childish. Any guess as to its definition? By the way, many of these words are suitable for most styles of English speaking and writing, including formal. Some, however, are more informal. Check a trusted dictionary if you are ever unsure. Next, we have let and let. They sound the same and have the same meaning, smaller than usual. But one is spelled L-E-T-T-E. -E. In other words, it has an extra T-E at the end. Both were borrowed from the French language. Some examples of the L-E-T spelling are booklet, which is a book with only a few pages, droplet, a very small drop of water, and eyelet, a very small hole. So what then might a piglet be? The longer spelling, L-E-T-T-E, -E, only forms a diminutive in a few English words like novelette, a short novel. The closely related ending E-T-T-E -E also makes things smaller than their usual size, such as kitchenette. Surely you can guess its meaning. On to words formed from the ending L-I-N-G. This ending mainly changes adult animal words into baby animal words. Other times, it expresses affection for a person. For instance, the word darling means little deer. A duckling is a baby duck. And a fingerling can refer to either a baby fish or a very small potato. That's funny-ish, right? A few years ago, a company called Wowee released another kind of fingerling, a finger-sized baby animal toy for children. And finally, we have mini. It is today's only prefix. Putting mini at the start of a word 
means that thing is smaller or shorter than usual or normal. Examples include lots of kinds of vehicles, such as a minibus, mini car, mini bike, and mini cab, and women's clothing, like a mini skirt, mini dress, and mini kini. Do you have any idea what a minikini is? The original word has been shortened, so you may not recognize it. I'll give you a hint. It's something worn at the beach. Earlier today, I told you that some diminutives can have negative meanings. Some of the terms can be critical or sarcastic depending on how they are used. Suppose, for example, you are at a train station trying to buy a ticket, but the machine is not working right. Someone in line behind you says, hey, sweetie, there are people waiting for that machine. You can guess that they are not expressing affection. That said, English diminutives can be some of the most useful, natural, and endearing words in the English language. I'm Alice Bryant. And I'm Brian Lynn. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. In the years just after the Civil War, America was led by Andrew Johnson. The Democrat rose from vice president to president when Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in April of 1865. Andrew Johnson soon found himself in a bitter struggle with Congress. In 1868, radical members of the Republican Party held a trial in the Senate. They tried to remove the president from office. But they could not prove their charges, and their effort failed by one vote. When the trial was over, Johnson had less than a year left in office. He retired to his home in Tennessee. By then, Americans had elected a new president. Larry West and Shep O'Neill tell the story of the election of 1868. There was no question about the Republican choice for president. Party leaders wanted General Ulysses Grant. Grant had been head of the Union Army during the last part of the Civil War. Under his leadership, the Union had won. And now, he was the best-liked man in the country. Wherever Grant went, Former soldiers waited to shake the hand of the man who had led them to victory against the Confederacy. The Democratic Party had a much more difficult time choosing a candidate for president in 1868. Forty-seven men wanted the nomination. After several votes during its convention, the party failed to choose one above the others. Finally, party leaders looked for a compromise candidate. They chose Horatio Seymour, a former governor of New York State. He won the nomination on the 22nd ballot. Seymour, at first, said he could not accept the honor. He said he did not want to be president. But finally, after much urging from other party leaders, 
he agreed to run against Grant. The presidential campaign was a strange one. Neither Grant nor Seymour campaigned very hard. Grant told his advisors he would take no part in the election campaign. Seymour spent much of the time working on his farm. The real campaigning was done by party supporters. Republicans urged Union men to vote as you shot for Ulysses Grant, the man who won the Civil War. They warned that Horatio Seymour and the Democrats were all secret rebels in their hearts. Seymour's supporters spent most of their time answering Republican charges. They struck back by accusing Grant of being a liar. They said he was controlled by extremists. They said he would rule from the White House like a dictator. The Democratic attacks failed. Grant got more popular votes and electoral votes than Seymour. He won the election. It was a great victory for the military hero. Yet it also was the start of an administration that would suffer many problems. Ulysses Grant would prove to be much less successful in politics than in war. As Andrew Johnson prepared to leave the White House a few months after Grant's election, he would look back on some successes during his time as president. True, he had lost the political fight to control the rebuilding or reconstruction of the defeated southern states, but he had won the equally important fight to keep the presidency independent from Congress. Johnson also could look back on some successes in foreign relations. During his administration, he got Napoleon III of France to withdraw French forces from Mexico, and he got more territory for the United States. In the spring of 1867, the Russian minister in Washington made a surprise offer. He said his country was willing to sell some of its territory in North America. Secretary of State William Seward quickly prepared a treaty accepting the offer. Russia wanted $10 million for the land, Seward said the United States would pay only seven million dollars. Russia accepted and the treaty was signed. The United States flag was raised over Alaska. Many Americans protested the purchase of Alaska. They thought seven million dollars was too much to pay for a worthless piece of frozen land. They said the deal was foolish. They called it Seward's Folly. In time, of course, these critics were proved wrong. Alaska's wealth in oil, natural gas, trees, fish, and animal skins makes its purchase one of the greatest deals any country ever made for territory. On March 4, 1869, Ulysses Grant traveled to Washington for his inauguration as the 18th President of the United States. Outgoing President Andrew Johnson refused to take part in the ceremony. Before Grant arrived, Johnson left the White House. As he walked out, he told a friend, I think I can already smell the fresh mountain air of my home in Tennessee. Americans had high hopes for their new president. They saw Grant as a strong and silent soldier, a great leader, 
who had won a long and bitter war. But there was another side to Grant which most people did not see. During the Civil War, the general had been a great hero. For many years before that, however, he had been considered a failure. As a young man, Grant entered West Point, the nation's school for army officers. He did poorly in his studies. He did not like responsibility. Somehow he completed his studies and became an army officer. He fought in America's war against Mexico. After the war, Grant got into trouble. He drank too much whiskey, too often. The army forced him to resign. For the next eight years, he tried one thing after another. He failed at each one. He tried farming, for example, and failed. He tried selling land and failed at that too. At last, Grant appealed to his father for a job in a store. He held this low-paying job until the Civil War started. Then he finally got back into the army. He got his chance to succeed. Still, the years of poverty and failure affected Ulysses Grant. They made him lack trust in his own judgment and abilities. This feeling showed itself when Grant reached the White House. The new president had little knowledge of politics or government, and he refused to ask for advice from experts. To do so, he felt, would show a lack of intelligence. For advice, he depended on close friends. These were the men with whom he had served during the Civil War. Grant had never been able to make much money. He liked and had great respect for men who had. He became friends with some of these wealthy men. He accepted gifts from them. This weakness for money and power became clear when he announced his choices for his cabinet. Grant named a rich businessman to be Treasury Secretary. The Senate rejected him. Grant named another rich businessman for Navy Secretary. This nomination was approved even though the man had never been on a ship. Grant named several other rich people and old military friends to the cabinet. Many lacked political experience. Some critics attacked the appointments. One critic said, Never was an administration begun with more hope and less ability. The best advisor Grant named was John Rawlins as Secretary of War. Rawlins was a good judge of men, and he was wiser than most of Grant's other friends. He alone, of all those around the President, would argue with Grant when he believed him to be wrong. Rawlins, however, was in poor health. His condition grew worse during the summer of 1869. Early in autumn, he died. Rawlins' death hurt President Grant deeply. But the lack of honest, wise advice in the White House would hurt the country even more. That will be our story in the next program of The Making of a Nation. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.